let's talk about the principles of counting. It seems like a very like weighty title. Like, yeah, we're talking about principles of counting. Um, principles of counting. Um, and there's kind of, well, there's a couple main ones here. So let's look at an example. Let's say you're planning your schedule next quarter. Next quarter. And let's see. There are, and you're going to take the following classes. Stats, which there are four sections of. Um, bio. Okay, we're not going to be super specific. I'm going to be like bio 2A, whatever. Whatever bio class you want to take. Bio, there's two different sections. Seems a little unrealistic, or whatever. Um, you're going to take a chem class as well because you are glutton for pain. There's three sections. And then finally, there's going to be, you're going to take a music class as well because you need something to keep your sanity. And there's five sections of that. Assuming none of the classes like overlap, so you can pick any one of each one, how many different schedules could you make? How many possible schedules? Could we make? Well, there's a couple ways to do this. One of them is just going to be the short answer, but we can kind of go piece by piece here. So I could either pick the first section of stats or the second section of stats or the third section of stats or the fourth section of stats. I have to choose one of them because I'm going to take stats, but I have four choices. And then just going down the list, for each stats choice I make, I could choose either one of the bio classes. So I can choose the first section or the second section of bio, the first section or the second section of bio. So already, just looking at this, having just talked about all the possible ways we could pick a stats class and a bio class, how many total possibilities are there? I said there's eight. Right? I can do first section of stats with either the first or second section of bio, second with first or second, third, first, second, fourth, first, second. So I have eight different possibilities, but I'm not done, right? Because then for each of these sections of bio, I can then pick three different sections of or one of three different sections of chemistry. So I could pick the first, the second, or the third. The first, I don't want to write all this out because it's going to get lengthy with the third. And I can do that for each of these. So at this level, I have four possible schedules. At this level, I have four times two possible schedules. At this level down here, I'm going to have four times two times three possible different paths I can take, which is going to be what, eight times three, which is 24. And then for each chemistry class, I could then say, well, which music class I'm going to take. The first one, the second one, the third one, the fourth one, or the fifth one. So for all 24 of these possible schedules with stats, biology, and chemistry, then for each of those, I have another five possible music classes I could take. So at this level, I have four times two times three times five, which is 120 different possible schedules I could take. Maybe I take the first, the second section of stats and the first section of bio and the third section of chemistry and the fourth section of music, right? There's a lot of different combinations here. Um, there's a word that Dr. Dell used in class on Friday that I kind of want to avoid using. He talked about the choices being independent versus dependent. Well, he didn't really say versus dependent. He just said like he was doing the addition rule and he said like we could add them together because they're independent. And the reason I want to kind of avoid that rule is because there's a very specific definition of what independence means when you, when you take probability and stats. So we'll kind of come back to that because we will talk about that in this class, but I wouldn't say that these events are dependent on, on each other or independent of each other. There's just kind of a, we want to do this and this and this and this. So when I'm thinking about the multiplication rule, I'm thinking about, I want one thing and another thing. 
I'm going to multiply two possibilities together if I need both of them to happen. So I think of the multiplication rule as or occurs when we have and. We want one thing and another thing to happen. I want to take a stats class and a biology class and a chemistry class and a music class. Question? No. Okay. You kind of look like you're like, I'll take that one. Okay. So let's look at one more example. Let's say we wanted to study the effects of fertilizer and light on plant growth. We're going to study five different fertilizers at three different light levels. And we don't just want to do one of each because that's not very scientific, right? Like if you only do one of each, like maybe that one was just weird for some reason. So we're going to do a few of each. We're going to do, we're going to have four replicates of each treatment. How many plants do we need? Well, how many treatments are there? How many treatments are there? We have five different fertilizers and we have three different light levels. So I'm guessing there's gonna be 15 different treatments because we need each fertilizer combined with each light level. So there are 15 equal to five times three different treatments. We can make a whole grid if we want to, right? You can say like, I have, Treatment one, treatment two, treatment three, treatment four, treatment five, and I have light level A, B, and C. So to get each of these to occur, right, we have one here, plant here, plant here, right? We have all these plants. One at each light level and each treatment and each fertilizer. But the, oh, sorry, you can't see that. But then we need four of each. So then we're going to say, well, there's 15 treatments, and then we need four of each. So we're going to get 15 times four is not 20, James, it is 60. 60 plants in total. And this, this may seem obvious, it may not. But it definitely, the reason we're kind of going over what may seem obvious is because eventually things start to seem less obvious. So like, well, it's not exactly 100% clear how we're going to get these combinations. So bear with me if it seems obvious, because it's going to get less obvious real quick. Um, sure. On the other hand, we could also talk about the addition principle. Where I could say, well, this one, these one, these ones, these examples sometimes make less sense because it's not as common a thing. But let's say we had, I don't know, now I'm trying to, I don't actually have an example because it's not something we do as much often, but hmm, sure. Let's say I want to pick a plant. That. Hmm, Sorry, I'm, I'm writing this in a terrible way. That's what happens when you don't. This is what I was like, I think I have a good one. I don't have a good one. I'm going to come back around to that. Because I will fully admit the addition principle, less necessary to be perfectly honest. The multiplication is like a little bit. Um, let's talk about permutations. Permutations and then shortly versus 
combinations. So the thing you should think when you hear permutations versus combinations is permutations order matters. I care about what order I these people finish a race or they're seated next to each other or any number of things. Whereas with combinations, we typically just care about the number of ways a thing can happen. It doesn't really matter how. So it's kind of like the difference of picking like three people from a group of 10 to form a committee and three people from a group of 10 to win a race where order matters. That's one example. Um, let's say we have this book example. So at the library, there are books we can check out, obviously. There are four different math books. Six different biology books. And five different chemistry books. Excuse me. And we're going to put them all on the shelf. Just as a quick aside, a lot of these examples feel very contrived. You're kind of like, we're just taking some books. Like, it seems like, okay, who's really doing this? So do kind of ignore the lack of realism because it's a mess. Will they also be with uh, replacement or without replacement? Right, we're definitely going to talk about that too. So first question, how many ways can we arrange these books? On a shelf. Assuming they're all on one shelf next to each other. There's not like multiple shelves. Well, I haven't, we haven't given any restrictions other than we just want to put them on shelf. Now they are all different. So order does matter. And sometimes it's not going to be super explicit if order matters or not. Someone's not going to say the words order matters. It'd be like, you have things that are all different or you have five identical. Like if this book had been, if this book, if this question had been, you have six identical bio books, four identical math books and five different chemistry books. The answer we'd get for the next part would be pretty different. Actually, In fact, we can even do that one after that, after this. So here, I'm just thinking, well, I have, let's see, I have a total of 15 books. And I want to organize them this way. So on the shelf, I have exactly 15 spots. So how many choices are there for my second book? This is actually, this would be an example, Crystal, of without replacement, because we're going to put the first book on the shelf and then we're not going to like take it back out and replace it. It's there, we're done with it. It can't move any other spot. So we have 15 possibilities for the first spot. And then there's going to be, well, we've used up one book. Now there's 14 books left to choose from. Now there's 13 books left to choose from and so on and so on. So at each next subsequent spot, we have one less book to choose from. Oops, I gave myself one too many spots. That's all right. Which we obviously don't want to write 15 times 14 times like all the way down to one. We have a notation for this. This is equal to 15 factorial. Now I know you mentioned this in class on Friday, but just to reiterate things everyone knows. When you talk about the number factorial, it means that number multiplied by every lesser number down to one. He, he writes it the other way. It doesn't matter which way you write it. I always like to start at the number I'm at and then go all the way down to one. He starts at one and goes all the way up to the number. It really doesn't matter which way you do it. It's just, I don't, I don't know why I did it that way, to be honest. Like, it's just the way I've always done it. A couple of things to know. Zero factorial is equal to one. One factorial is equal to one. 2 factorial is 2 times 1, and so on and so forth. A couple things to be aware of. Um, oh, what was I going to say? When you, uh, we'll get there in a minute. I should, I should keep asking questions instead of getting off on the sidetrack here. So 
let's ask another question. How many ways can we arrange the books? How many can we write clearly? Can we arrange the books if all the subjects have to be adjacent to each other or must be placed together? So I either have to, have, right, I can have all the math and then all the chemistry and then all the bio, or all the math and then all the bio and all the chemistry, right? So I can either have, you know, math, bio, chem, or, you know, math, chem, bio, et cetera. Let's say we did this first way, math, chem, bio. There are four math books, and there are four factorial ways of arranging the four math books. And then there are six biology books. So there's going to be six factorial ways of arranging those. And there's five chem books. So five factorial ways of arranging those. So here's all the math books together. Here's all the biology books together. Here's all the chem books together. All right, they, within each block, they can be rearranged, right? There's a lot of ways I can arrange four math books. Maybe calculus first, and then trig, and then pre-calc, and then a linear algebra. And maybe I've totally done them a different way, right? But then there's one more thing to consider. We didn't have to do math biochem. We could have done math chem bio, or chem bio math, or chem math bio, or whatever the other two possibilities are. There are one, two, three, there are three factorial ways of arranging the different groups of books. So we have to multiply by three factorial for the number of ways the subjects can appear. We can actually write, this, six is not too hard to write. It could either be math biochem or math chem bio or chem bio math or chem math bio or biochem math or biomath chem. There's exactly six ways of ordering the subjects. I do like, so let's ask a different question. Mm, let's not, no, not quite yet. We're still talking about permutations. So, The number of ways or arrangements, arrangements, catch my spelling seems excellent. Also known as permutations of n objects is n factorial. Talk about letters and words. I'm talking certain easy example. How many ways? So books will often phrase this as how many words can you make, but a word doesn't have to like spell anything rational or reasonable or something you'd recognize. So I'm going to say how many words, but what I really mean is how many different ways can we rearrange? the letters of the word math. But what people will ask is how many words can we make from the word math? So for example, someone might say something like, this is a word, A-T-M-H. That's not a real word, right? That's a word. That's so just to be aware, right? Books will sometimes say, How many words can you make from this word? And they mean, How many ways can you rearrange the letters? Sorry, I know my, I, I was like, I was writing this. I was like, This looks terrible. So I'm asking, I'm saying this to, to is reading this part here How many words can we make from the word math? 
But what we're really saying is how many different ways can we rearrange the letters of the word math? Another way to think of this is how many distinct ways. Well, just like before, we have spots and we have choices. There are four choices for the first spot, either A, M, T, or H. And then once you pick one of them, three choices, and then two choices, and then one choice. So it looks like there's gonna be four factorial ways. We could even write them all out if we really wanted to. It gets to be kind of pain. But let me do, well, I'll do one of them because I wanna point out something. So holding A in the first spot, we could have A, T, M, H. We could have A, T, H, M. I've done all the ways with A and T. So I'm gonna do A, M, and then T, H. I guess I wrote H, T, or A, M, T, H. I've done AT, I've done AM, now I have to try AH. I'm gonna have MT or TM. So you might notice that for this first one being A, there are six ways of rearranging the last three letters. And then I could do that same sort of process for any other first letter. So if my first letter was T, there are six ways of rearranging the other three letters. And if my first letter was M, there are six ways of rearranging the other three letters. If my first letter was H, there are six ways of rearranging the other three letters. And notably, none of these rearrangements will be the same as each other because these six here all start with A. None of these start with A. None of these start with A. None of these start with A. These start with T. None of the rest of them do, right? And so on and so on. So they really are all distinct. On the other hand, what if instead the word were data? Well, those A's are the same letter. So I'm actually not going to get 24, even though I got 24 before when I had four letters, because although I still have four choices of the first letter, three choices of the second letter, two for the second, for the third letter, and one for the last letter, some things are going to look like repetitions. Let me show you what I mean. Let's say I wrote, so let's say I did all the ones starting with D. So I had D-A-T-A, -A, and I'm going to label this as A1, A2, D, A1, A2, T, D, A2, A1, T, D, B2, T, A1, D, I've done A, A, I've done T, A1, A2, D, T, A2, A1. So check this out. A lot of those are the same. Well, not a lot, but like, right, this one here is the same as that one there. And this one here is the same as that one there. And this one here is the same as that one there. It looks like I've double counted, and I have, right? If I continue this process, every time I have something with A1 and A2, there's gonna be another one where they're switched. So here, the number of distinct words is four factorial, the number of ways of or ordering four different letters, divided by two factorial, where the two factorial is the number of ways of reordering the duplicate letters, right? Every combination, I could either have A1 and A2 or A2 and A1 switched, and they're going to look like the same. So I have to divide by my double counting there to get 24 over 2, which is 12. And you can even ask this kind of question for an example with more letters, like the word statistics. Or Mississippi is often a common example, where you've got lots of repetition, lots of duplicated letters. So let's see. So let's say I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So there's 10 letters. So I'm going to start off with 
10 factorial ways of arranging them. But then there's some duplication. How many S's are there? Three. Three. So there's definitely, for every combination, every combination is going to get repeated three factorial times. So it's like 10 minus three factorial, or three minus, no, 10 minus. It's not that, but I know what you're asking about. And we're definitely going to talk about that. That's the combination or permutation thing, but we're, we're working towards that for sure. Um, but yeah, the, yeah. There's actually, I mean, it's related, but it's not the same. So that's the number of ways the S's can be rearranged. And have the words still look the same, right? I could take this combination and reorder those S's in six different ways. S1 could be first, S2 could be second, S3 could be third, or it could be S1, S3, S2, or S2, S1, S3, or so on and so on and so on. And then the same thing is true about the one, two, three T's and the one, two I's. So this ends up equaling, I mean, to be perfectly honest, it doesn't really matter what this ends up equaling. Like this is the way you should probably actually write the answer. We could totally multiply it up if we really wanted to. And actually there are a few things to see in doing this. So you can see right from the get go that the three factorial parts gonna cancel out right away. So the three times two times one will cancel out with the three times two times one. And then three times two is six. That's gonna cancel out with a six. And then a two cancels out with an eight and left with a four. So I'm left with four times 10 times nine times seven, uh, 63, 630 something. 2,400 plus 120, 2520. Doesn't really matter what the number, right? Like this answer is not any more meaningful than this answer really. So there's 2,520 ways you could rearrange these letters to get a different word. Or I guess what I was saying is there's 2,520 distinct ways of ordering these 10 specific letters. Whereas there are 10 factorial permutations, which is a lot more. So in an art competition, which I guess people have art competitions, feels weird to have an art comp, like, like who's to say who's first and who's second, whatever. In our competition with 10 entries, how many ways can we award first, second, and third? So now we're limiting the number of things we can actually choose. It's kind of like the example we did in class where you said, you know, you have five different textbooks for different subjects and you can only take two of them to class or two of them to the library, I think you said, to study from. So how many ways can I pick three different art things to be first, second, and third? Well, how many choices are there for first? There's 10. There's nine choices for second. There's eight choices for third, which is 720. But the way we might think of this is you want to say, well, I kind of want to think of it as 10 times nine times eight times seven times six times five times four times three times two times one over seven times six times five times four times three times two times one, which is 10 factorial over seven factorial or more interestingly, 10 factorial over 10 minus three factorial. This is the number of ways of permuting three things out of 10 things. So people write this in so many different ways. Um, the calculator notation that I'm used to seeing is 10 P three. And they're actually, so I don't know. I'm a TI guy. It's kind of the kind of calculator I've used my whole life. Practically, yeah. 
Um, if you look at a TI-80 whatever, and you want to calculate this without actually having to do it the long way, you can go to the, actually I'll put in the 10 first, and then you can go to math, and you can go over to probability and down to NPR, like the radio station, and then hit three, and there you go. So that's why someone might use that particular notation. I know in class, he was writing it more like this, also perfectly fine. There are probably other ways of writing it too, but I'm gonna, I'm, well, I'll probably default to this just because it looks the most like what the calculator does. But if you're looking, so what I do wanna point out, some of these things do get kind of calculation intensive. And so it is worthwhile to know where that button is on your calculator. So, the number of permutations, again, permutations where order matters of, I'm gonna use R, of R objects chosen from a set of N objects is, oh yeah, here's another one, P of N comma R, or N P R or P N R, whichever way you want to write it, is N factorial over N minus R factorial. And then it's going to end up equaling N times N minus one times N minus two, all the way down to N minus R plus one. But if you're going to remember anything, this is what you should remember. So, yeah, we're almost, we're going to get there. Give another example. A security code is formed by an arrangement. of four different letters and three different digits. How many different codes are possible? So again, even though we have a formula for this, I probably wouldn't use the formula to be perfectly frank. If I'm going to do four letters and three digits, how many choices are there for the first letter? How many letters are in the alphabet? 26. Um, actually, and this is something that I have found very useful over the years. I think it's really worth knowing that the number of cards in a deck is twice the number of letters in the alphabet. So there are 13 cards in each suit. 13 clubs, 13 hearts, 13 spades, 13 diamonds. And there are 26, which is twice that number in the alphabet. And then twice that again is 52. There's 52 cards in the deck. So sometimes you could think of like the number of some people, there are, there are, there, I've definitely seen problems where people are like, let each, let each red card in the deck be represented by a letter in the alphabet. And let each black card be something like, it's just, there, there's a nice kind of parallel there. So it's a worth knowing. So then since all the letters have to be different, the next, num the next letter I have 25 choices for, the next letter I have 24 choices for, the next letter I have 23 choices for. All right, how many digits are there to choose from first? How many digits are there? So let's see, we've got one or two or three or four or five or six or seven or eight or nine or zero, right? Zero is also a digit. Those are all the digits though, right? Digit just means a single number, right? It's not like 15 or 27 or whatever. So there are 10 choices for a first digit, nine choices for the second, eight choices for the third. Although sometimes people will exclude zero from being a choice or at least from being the first choice. So like, in fact, yeah, I'll say that something. I'll speak to that more. So we could write it like this or we could write it using the formula 
26 P four times 10 P three. Writing this notation feels weird to me. It's fine. That would be 26 factorial over 26 minus four factorial times 10 factorial over 10 minus three factorial. What if the letters and the digits don't have to be distinct? What if my security code could be AAAA888? Right? That would be allowed if they didn't have to be distinct. How many possibilities are there then? Well, how many switches are there for my first letter? There's 26. How about for my second letter? Also, right? And my third? Also. And my fourth? Also. So in this case, there are 26 to the fourth ways of choosing the four letters because I can repeat each letter as much as I want. And similarly, there's going to be 10 to the third ways of picking the digits. So I could have A, 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 0, 0, 0 or B, 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 5, 5, 5, or C, B, A, B, 6, 6, 2, right? I can repeat numbers, but I don't have to repeat numbers. So that's kind of the difference, right? If you can, so this is kind of the, this is kind of the without replacement, right? You can't repeat things with replacement. You can repeat numbers as much as you want to your heart's desire. So permutations, order matters. Right? We're definitely thinking of things in different orders being different. Whereas when we talk about combinations, order doesn't matter. And I shouldn't say, I shouldn't say that. So sometimes things, the, the phrasing can be challenging. So I'll say order not important. It's kind of like, I mean, here's a real, Basic example, it's kind of like the difference between ordering a pizza and mushroom pizza and a mushroom pizza and mushroom pizza, a pepperoni and mushroom pizza, or a mushroom and pepperoni pizza. It doesn't matter which way you say it, you're going to get the same pizza. I like mushroom pepperoni, by the way. It's a good pizza. Sometimes black olives, something like that. Okay. So, right, order doesn't matter there. I don't care how I say it, I'm still going to get the same thing. So, Before we talk about this combination, how many permutations, order matters, of three letters chosen from the first five? A, B, C, D, E. Okay, well, I could have A, B, C. And then how many ways are there reordering A, B, and C? I got three things. How many ways can I order them? Three. I wish I could make an exclamation point with my finger. Three factorial. You can't see an exclamation point, right? Like this is like the dot. And this is okay. Three factorial. Right. There's three, there's six ways total. A, C, B, B, A, C, B, C, A, C, A, B, C, B, A. Great. So there's six ways of doing that. And then well, I didn't have to pick A, B, and C. Maybe I picked A, B, and D, which there's six ways of doing that. Or maybe I picked A, B, and E. Okay. So I can keep going, right? I could have done, I guess I'm going to keep going. I've, I've exhausted A, B, right? A, B, A, B, A, B. There's no other way to get A, B, but something else. So let's try A, D, E. Oh, I skipped C. How did I get to E? No, that's right. Okay, I'm good. A, D, E. I skipped C. I could have done A, C, D, and then A, C, A, C, E. I'm done with A. Now I could have B, C, D, B, C, E, B, D, E. I always miss one. I'm missing one. A, B, C, A, B, D, A, B, E. 
ACD, ACE, ADE, ACD, ACE, ADE. I'm missing one. What am I missing? Am I missing one? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I don't know. Let's check. Oh, I'm missing, I'm missing CDE. I just didn't keep going. I got the BDE. I'm missing CDE. So looking at this, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten different ways of picking the three letters. And then there are six different ways of or ordering those three letters. So it looks like I'm getting a total of 60 ways of permuting any three letters from these five. And that makes sense because if we actually did the formula, P53, we're going to get five factorial over five minus three factorial, which is five times four times three times two times one over two times one, which is five times four times three, which is 60. We could have, I mean, that would, that's, so I should point out, this first way that is not the way you should do it, right? We could be like, oh, I'm picking three things from five. I should just use the formula. Or really, honestly, the way I would actually answer this question is the way I've been doing it every time. And I have three slots. I have five choices and then four choices and then three choices. Okay. On the other hand, how many combinations? of three letters from these five are there. Well, we've already written them all out. There's literally one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 different combinations. And everything below each of these is just a reordering of that combination. So we could say it's going to be 10, but the way we're actually calculating that 10 is you're taking the number of permutations and dividing it by the number of ways of ordering the number of things you've chosen. Excuse me. So basically you're taking all 60 permutations, but dividing by three factorial because I don't care about these six total ways I can order this. I just care about the one way it shows up. So that's gonna be five factorial over five minus three factorial and then also a three factorial. And this is equal to, so there's ways of writing this as well. My preferred way of writing this and the way I'll probably default to is this way. The five over the three in a big parentheses. But you can also write this as C, five C three or C five three or C of five, right? There's like, really like, why can't people just pick one way of doing it? I don't know. But all of these ways mean and are read as five choose three. Literally, the number of ways you can choose three things from five things and not have order matter. And it would exactly be five factorial over two factorial times three factorial. It always feels silly to me to write the ones. Like, you don't really need to write the ones because multiply by one doesn't change anything. But then we can cancel the three, two, and one, and then 20 over two is 10. So you're taking your number of permutations, all 60 of them, and then dividing by the number of ways you can reorder those three things. So you're getting 60 divided by six, which is 10. So combinations order doesn't matter. Permutations order does matter. And it can sometimes be dicey telling which is which. Um, I'm gonna do two more things. Because there wasn't, there's, there's, there's something really interesting to say about this. I don't think we're gonna get there though. Not today, next time. Um, so let's look at this example. How many ways can we form a committee? of three people from a group of seven. Well, again, it doesn't matter which order I pick the three people in, right? I'm still gonna get the same group, whether I pick me first, my Grant second and Sarah third, or me first, Sarah second and Grant third, right? It doesn't matter what order people get picked in for something like this. 
right? It definitely does matter if you're talking about like the race example or the contest example where first is differentiated from second, which is differentiated from third. So here it's just going to be seven choose three, which is this is the way this is the way people like this is the normal way of writing. I can't say other than that. Like I know that's a little biased, but it is. This is the more mathematical. It doesn't matter which way you choose to write it. Ah, choose. No, not the, okay. I tried. It was a little funny in my head. So it's gonna be seven factorial over seven minus three factorial times three factorial. I'm always thinking of it as the top number factorial over the bottom number factorial times the difference factorial, or really those two numbers, four and three, should add up to seven. That's always how I'm seeing it. And then if we really wanted to calculate it, seven. So here's what you should actually, you shouldn't write out seven times six times five times four times three times two times one. Look at the bigger one, that's the four. I know everything starting at four on down, we're just gonna cancel out. Coming at seven times six times five times four times three times two times one, which I could write. I'm not gonna write because then it was gonna cancel the four factorial. And then I'm gonna get divided by the three times two times one. We shouldn't write this part here because we know that this part is just going to cancel out. But it does make sense to cancel out the bigger one because you're going to have less terms left to deal with if you do that. So we end up with seven times six times five or three times two times one. Three times two times one is six. So I can cancel that with the six there and be left with seven times five, which is 35. Um, and that point actually does make a lot of sense in that if you have to calculate like, 52 choose three, which is gonna be 52 factorial over three factorial times 49 factorial. You definitely wanna cancel out the bigger one, right? Like canceling out the three factorial still leaves you with 52 times 51 times 50 times 49, right? All the way down to five times four. But if you cancel out the bigger one, it's gonna be, okay, 52 times 51 times 50, stop, right? Because anything after that, is the 49 times 48 all the way down to over three factorial over or times 49 times all that stuff. So the bigger ones always have to cancel out. And then you're left with something. The number of terms on top should be the same as the number of terms on the bottom for this choose formula. It's kind of even after stuff cancels until you multiply it out and something else. Um, it was the same. Yeah, I'm thinking. So there was one example, there was a homework question that someone asked me about earlier, which I thought was kind of interesting. It was how many ways, or how many ways can we form a set out of N different objects? Meaning, if your set had like, say, five objects, you could have a set containing one of those things, or two of those things, or three of those things, and how many different ways could you do it? And here's the way I would, we'll talk more about this example next time, because it actually is very, very intimately related to this choose function. It's kind of super neat. But let me just leave you with the idea of how to think about this one. Let's say we had five objects. And let's say there were A, B, C, D, and E. That's a D, not an E. How many different sets can I make with any amount of these objects? Well, I could have the set containing literally none of them. That counts. I know it's kind of lame, but it definitely the problem does say that. I could also have the set containing one of them. How many different sets are there that contain one of them? Five, right? Five choose one. You have A, B, C, D, or E. Five total. How many sets could you have that contain two of them? Well, I could have the set containing A and B, or A and C, or A and D, or A and E, or whatever. And there's going to be five choose two of those, which is 10. Here's a fun fact. Now, we'll save that fun fact for a minute. 
The way of getting three of them, A, B, C, et cetera, there are five choose three ways of doing that, which is also 10. How many ways of choosing any four of them? So here's, here's what I think is kind of interesting. How many ways of choosing any four? Well, just pick the one you don't want. So there's a set that doesn't contain A and contains the other four, or a set that doesn't contain B and contains the other four, or a set that doesn't contain C, right? So there's literally five ways of doing that. Not A, not B, not C, not D, or not E. And there's five choose four ways of doing this, which is exactly equal to five. Because the number of ways of choosing four things is the same number as the number of ways of not choosing one of them. And then finally, we can pick all five. Okay, which is five choose five, which is equal to one. There's exactly one way of picking all five of them. All right, so check this out. What do these add up to? One plus five plus 10 plus 10 plus five plus one. Six, 16 times two is 32, which is two to the fifth. Here's what I want you to see. Well, there's a couple of things I want you to see. I want you to, I really want to tell you that if you take these numbers and add them together, it always adds up to like two to the real number. But there's another way you can see this. Let's say I had to pick five things. Well, I had to pick whether or not the thing's going to be in my set, right? Because each of these sets represents A is either in it or not, right? A can be in it or not, B can be in it or not, C can be in it or not. So at the first level, A can be either in or out. At the next level, B can be either in or out. So if I'm just thinking A and B, okay, great. There's four different ways I can have A or B. I can have A and B both in, A in, B out, A out, B in, A out, B out. And then the next level, C can be in or out. Look, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different ways I can have a set with A, B, or C. A and B and C in, A and B and C out, right? And so on and so on. So every time you add a new element, you double the number of possible sets. So if I add another one, right, if I add D, right, I don't want to write a lot, you're going to get twice as many because every set you had before, either now you can add D to it and get a set that has D in it, or you cannot and get a set that doesn't have D in it. I'll leave it there because I'm definitely out of time. <laughs>